I'm Todd Benjamin. Welcome to this broadcast uh, from the International Bar Association in uh, London. It's a great pleasure today to be with David Morley. He is a senior partner at Allen and Overy, one of the so-called uh, magic circle uh, firms. It's in 32 countries, has 46 offices, 525 uh, partners. And uh, I just want to start with some of your uh, financial results because I think they're more than numbers. I think it also tells something about the firm, all right? And in your latest fiscal year, which just ended in April, you had $2 billion in, in, in revenue. That's uh, up some 4%. And a profit per equity partner uh, was just under $2 uh, million. Uh, uh, you had particularly strong performances in London, the UAE, and your Luxembourg offices, and standout growth for dispute uh, resolution uh, globally. And also your corporate practice, you said, reached a, uh, a milestone. It's ranked the number one firm for uh, global cross-border uh, M&A. Uh, first of all, these results, you know, what does this tell you? Um, it tells us a number of things, I think, Todd. The, the, the first thing, I think, is that we've built a platform um, which um, has served us well in terms of the current economic conditions. And so, for example, we've, um, we have the largest global network of any of our major uh, competitors. And many of those things you've described, cross-border M&A, dispute resolution at the highest level, have gone global in, in a major way. That's a trend that's been going on for quite a few years, but it's, that trend's been reinforced um, in, uh, in recent years. And frankly, you know, times are pretty good for firms like us that are positioned, you know, lo looking after major uh, corporate clients um, in uh, event-driven uh, business. That's pretty good for us. How much of it do you think has to do with the firm and how much do you think just has to do with the environment right now? And what I mean by that, you know, there is yeah. a lot of uh, M&A activity uh, going on across the board. Okay. There is, yeah. Um, it's a bit of both, I think, uh, frankly. I, I would like to think that as a firm, we have uh, built up a strong uh, platform. I think how, you know, we've traditionally been known as being a top finance firm, if not the best finance firm in the world. Um, and we've worked really hard to build up our corporate practice as well to, uh, to, to match that reputation. What do you think, though, is driving so much of this M&A activity right, right, right now? It's a whole combination of, it's very, I mean, M&A is well known, it's very cyclical. Um, so this is not going to last forever. Um, but there's a whole series of factors that have driven it. The um, rebound in economic confidence in the US and the UK, I think, is uh, one factor. There's a lot of cheap money uh, out there at the moment. Interest rates are still at record lows. Corporates can raise funds very, uh, very, very historically low levels. So those uh, are all factors. And people are looking for growth. Growth is hard to come by. It, all our clients will tell you the same thing. Are you optimistic going forward? And the reason I'm saying this, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of nervousness as we speak right now over a slowdown in, in, in China. We've seen the commodity uh, cycle really going uh, bust. Oil prices are less than half the level uh, they were uh, last year. I mean, I could just tick it all off. Uh, a lot of concern about emerging markets, a lot of concern uh, once the Fed starts raising rates, the uh, knock-on effect that could have on emerging markets and, and their corporate debt. Your thoughts? Yeah, I'm actually fairly optimistically. I mean, I think hopefully, I think realistically optimistic about, uh, about the immediate future, looking forward over the next 12 to 18 months for, for our firm. Um, I think the uh, M&A cycle has got a way to go still. Um, you are seeing, I think, increased economic confidence, particularly in uh, the US economy has definitely come roaring back. Uh, the UK economy is doing pretty well. Europe, I think, will start to bounce back pretty soon. Um, financial markets are still buoyant. Um, and, you know, and for us, there's a, still a lot of, interestingly, at this stage of the cycle, there's still a lot of very big ticket uh, dispute resolution. What makes you optimistic work. about Europe? Um, I think eventually um, the problems will be fixed um, in one way or another. And um, when you look at the underlying economies of Europe, you look at Germany and you look at France, you know, there's some very strong businesses there. And we found, you know, throughout the last um, seven years that our operations in a lot of those countries have done extremely well. You know, so there, you know, it's not just you can't just paint it with one coat of paint to say it's all terrible. 
But as a senior partner, when you're thinking strategically, when you're looking at the vision uh, for the uh, firm, is it driven more by what you assume the economic conditions will be or what certain activity be, will be uh, regardless of the economic conditions? We have tried to build a model which w w in which we can thrive, if you like, not irrespective of economic conditions, but in most decent, uh, in most economic conditions. Law firms, in a sense, and firms like ours, tend to have a bit of a natural hedge when things turn. We, we tend to do well when either economies are doing really well or they're doing really badly. And, and where I think we do less well, and I think most large law firms would say the same thing, is where there's not a lot, where you're kind of wallowing in, in the middle. Because when economies are bad, there may be more dispute resolution, for instance. Correct? For example, right. more restructurings, more bankruptcies, more things, more messes that need to be sorted out, more investigations, um, um, and so on, more refinancings. Um, so, yeah, there's always going to be a demand. Yeah. Now, one of the things you said in your you know, annual report here is ANO believes this growth, and we talked about it earlier, is due to the fact that it sees more of the global economy than other large firms. What do you mean by more of the global economy than other we, um We did some uh, research and we, we, um, we looked at a whole range of league tables for every type of activity from M&A to bond issues to projects to bank finance and so on, the whole range. And we weren't selective about this information. And, from, and we uh, realized that over the last year, we had been involved in transactions over $1.3 trillion worth of value. Of, of transactions, which is more than any other law firm in the world. So we have a, we have a spread in terms of our work from the M&A to financial markets to dispute resolution, which is probably broader than any other uh, firm. So we do get to see a lot more of what is going on around the world, plus the global platform and the number of countries that we're in. So we've got insights from that um, that perhaps others can't quite match. Why do you think certain law firms are doing better than other law firms? That's a, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, I, think there is, I think there's no doubt that when you look at the profession as a whole, that there is um, an increased sort of sense of dispersion, if you like. So in other words, the stronger firms are tending to get stronger and the gap between them and the less strong firms is tending to widen and that pace, I think, is accelerating. Um, there's a lot of factors at play there. Partly it's about... Um, it's about uh, a talent. Um, it's about how can you attract the best talent? Can you afford to pay uh, the best talent? Not just partners, but also uh, associates as well. It's about platform. You know, if you've got the platform, it tends to attract talent uh, to that platform, which is reinforcing. So if you're in a weaker, if you're in a, a less strong firm, you find yourself losing talent to the stronger firms. And that, you know, that can be quickly become um, quite destructive. It's interesting that when you talk about this sort of this, you know, disparity that's going on or this split that's going on, the stronger firms getting stronger and the weaker getting weaker, that's reflective in, in many ways of what's happening in society when a lot of people are talking about sort of the, the difference between the haves and have-nots, or is that too yeah. much of a stretch in terms of an analogy? Um, I, I think that you, there is some um, analogy there, um, and th th there's something going on which is where, and I mean, actually, you probably see it most acutely in the US, where there's a kind of more of a sense of, and in the legal industry, you see this, you see it in many other industries, winner takes all. Uh, you see it in sports. Yeah. Look at football. You know, the top players earn vast multiples more than the average players. And the same process is going on in the law now. Now, you mentioned earlier, one of the reasons you think the, uh, the, the, the stronger firms are getting even stronger or even larger is, in effect, their ability to pay. All right, and to attract talent. And that you said is partly the, the platform, it's also having the, the, the financial muscle, if you have, no one's, someone's really good, to say, hey, here's a signing bonus or whatever. And one of the things you've done now is added a bonus pool uh, to your global pool in terms of what you pay your partners out yep. of. Why did you make this move? Um, we made that move because we wanted to make sure that we, we remained in a position where we could compete in the market for the very best talent. And the market for the best legal talent has definitely changed over the last 10 years quite dramatically. And it's been largely driven by the US uh, firms. 
who moved away from the, lock, the so-called lockstep model of compensation probably 15, 20 years ago um, and to move towards a much more kind of more performance orientated, if you like, compensation system. Um, our system is still a lockstep. We believe in that and we want to preserve that, but we recognize that we need flexibility to be able to attract and retain the very best people on terms that are competitive with the market. But who, who judges in terms of what gives somebody the right to get a larger bonus perhaps than somebody else out of this special yeah. pool? I mean, lateral hire, one can, you know, see how that may work. Look, look at what this guy's done at this as a firm. He saw it, look, look at the book he can bring to us, so on and so forth. Um, is this causing any tension within uh, the partnership? And, and again, who arbitrates uh, this, you know? Do you have a you know, certain set of criteria? Uh, yeah, we, um, obviously you've got to have a group of partners who ultimately are responsible for making that judgment. Um, it's not capable of being uh, you know, plugged into a computer and the computer gives you an answer. It has to be ultimately a, a human judgment um, on, uh, about that. We, don't have, we deliberately don't have uh, specific criteria for that um, because we think there are it's, the roles are too complicated, they're too different, they're too varied and so on to try and pin it down to a defined set of criteria we think would just only lead to more and more problems. So it's, it's undefined. It has to be exceptional. And you know it when you see it. You know it when you see it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, if anyone who has questions, uh, please submit them. And of course, uh, we'll try and get as many answered as, as possible. Um, one of the things that you also mentioned right there, you know, you're keeping with the, the lock step system, something that you say U.S. firms have done away with. Most firms have. Yeah, most. Mm -hmm. Why are you keeping uh, with that? And does it really reward the best? Yeah, I, I think you have to stand back and, and see that m most law firms' um, compensation systems will fit somewhere on a spectrum. And at one extreme, you've got a so-called pure lockstep, where you just pay by seniority. And at the other extreme, you've got a pure uh, merit-based or so-called eat what you kill. Actually, most firms are somewhere in the middle. They're somewhere along that spectrum. Yeah. There's not that much variation between them. We, we believe that the lockstep um, encourages a culture of collaboration, which is very important to our model. I mean, it's absolutely fundamental to the way we think about ourselves as a firm and the way that we serve our clients. So we think the lockstep has a lot of value in that. Um, like all remuneration systems, it's not perfect. Um, it has its flaws, um, and we're adapting to the market. But obviously, you're dealing with some very big egos, uh, you know, at, at, at presumably uh, because, uh, and they believe very strongly in, in their skills. And some partners may be uh, more willing to pick up the phone and share with another partner as opposed to you know, eating what they kill themselves because maybe they could get this exceptional bonus or, or so forth. You know, how can you make a system which rewards collaboration? I mean, this we, is a yeah, big... Yeah, I, I mean, we've, well, I've been with the firm 35 years right. and it's always been kind of part of our DNA that we work together as a firm. We've never had a kind of star system based on you know, individuals being paid a lot more than other individuals. Um, we've never had that. We never thought that that was the right model for us. It can work for some, but not for us. And so, you know, our strength comes from our ability to work together to best serve clients, particularly across uh, borders and across uh, practice areas. And, and we can demonstrate conclusively that our most profitable work is, is the more um, countries that are involved and the more practice groups that are involved, the more profitable the work. So it's actually in everybody's interest. And so our comp system is designed, if you like, to reinforce that idea. In fact, 71% of the firm's work is cross-border, 25% involves five yeah, or more countries. The vast majority of our work is cross-border now, yeah. And, and uh, the least profitable work we have is work that is done in only one country. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to just you for a moment, okay? Because you, know, you went to a state comprehensive, you weren't the product of a private uh, school. No. And then you went on to Cambridge, and as you said, then you joined, uh, you know, Alan Overy as a, a trainee back in 1980. Uh, you always wanted to practice the law. What is it about the law that just appealed to you, and how do you think it's changed since you, you joined? Yeah, um, well, the second part of that is a very big question. Um, 
I mean, for me, I, I, I don't know why I, I had no family connection with the law. Um, I, I, I guess I was watching too much Ironside, if you, for the viewers who will remember that programme. And um, anyway, I, I guess I had a, um, and I think this is true of a lot of people who go into the law, probably have a higher than average sense of kind of social justice and, and fairness, if you like. Um, and um, and so there's something about the law that appeals to you, that appeals to people on that level, um, and it appealed to me. Um, I went to A and O in those days. There were no websites, there were no brochures, there was no material. I mean, it was actually very difficult to get information about which were the right firms to go to. I applied to ten firms. A and O began with an A, so they got the first letter, the first interview, and I've been there ever since. So um, so I was lucky. But in those days, just to give you an idea of how things have changed. When I joined the firm in 1980, ANO was about 35 partners, um, and its total revenues were about four million dollars. Um, now we're 530 partners, and revenues are two billion. So a lot has uh, changed. In those days, if anyone had said you'd be practicing with Polish lawyers, with Thai lawyers, with Japanese lawyers, with American lawyers, but, but you know they would have called for the men in white coats to take you away. It was inconceivable. But what is it besides Ironside, you know, uh, <laughs> that, that makes you love the law so much? Because obviously, you know, your real area of expertise is in the banking sector. You know, they've had a lot of hard knocks uh, yeah. lately. Uh, but what is it about the law itself that you believe so passionately in? It's, um, I think, I, d I do believe deep down that, um, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a higher purpose to, to what we do. Um, and I, do, I believe very strongly, for example, uh, in the rule of law um, and in a lot of the transactions where we are operating around the world, we're bringing um, a sense of the rule of law and all of the things that make that up, integrity, objectivity, fairness, due process, all those kinds of things. Um, we, we have to be a role model uh, for that in, in what we do. And, and I think, you know, that's something that we kind of, where there's a wider contribution that law firms um, are making. A lot of people are very cynical about that, I know, and say, well, that all sounds very idealistic. So, uh, but, I, but I do think there is an element to what we do and a responsibility that we have to contribute in that way. But at the same time, uh, you know, you also represent some very big financial firms who've done some very bad things. We do. So how do you justify that? Well, I don't think. Given what you've said well, I don't think, about the rule of law, I don't think any decent lawyer would be making a moral judgment about <laughs> about their clients. They, they, um, you know, we have we have work to do uh, for our clients. It's not for us to make moral judgments about them. Um, we have to serve our clients to the best of our um, ability, and I, I think that's right. Now, you were the managing partner before taking on the role of the senior partner, and the managing partner is akin to the a CEO. Uh, you're more akin to the executive uh, chairman. Um, how do you think this distinction benefits your firm? And basically, how do the two roles differ day to day? And for anyone who's thinking of restructuring or trying to find a new model, what do you think the key questions are that they need to ask themselves? Yeah. Um, first of all, I think that, uh, I mean, the way we do it is because of our scale, we have essentially two people, for, two partners full time who are responsible for managing executive management of the firm. And that works for us. Uh, that wouldn't necessarily work for a smaller firm. Um, it, might not work, it might not work for a firm that wasn't as diverse and as global as we are, but for us it works. Um, I think um, also I wouldn't get too hung up on structure. I think sometimes lawyers can get over worked up about the exact governance structure um, because in most law firms, I think in most partnerships, it's true that there's a formal power structure and there's an informal power structure. And you know, it's the nature of partnership that one is um, working with both at the same time. And that's, that's not nefarious. I mean, that's just a reality of life. And so you would involve in a part, but we're a very democratic partnership. You know, we have one partner, one vote um, on the big issues, including election of leadership. Um, we have secret ballots uh, for those issues. And it's, a, it's very democratic. It's, it's a consensual firm. It's a consensual partnership. And so when you're looking at you know, how decisions are made, um, the, the, the people that are involved in the partnership will differ depending on what the decision is and who it affects. 
Uh, do you think you benefited being the uh, managing partner before uh, taking on the role of senior I partner? Do, yes, and I do think. So how? Yeah, I do think I benefited from that because I got a, a, a much better understanding of the nuts and bolts of the operations and performance of the firm, and you know what makes it tick. Okay, we have a question here from Paul Herricks from uh, Gowlings. Uh, what new markets are you thinking about entering? Because of course, in this past year. You opened offices in Barcelona, uh, Johannesburg, and Toronto, and recently confirmed its intention to open in South uh, Korea. Yes. Why those particular offices at this time? What do you see there that made you, you know, put your flag there? Yeah. Uh, and what other markets potentially could look attractive to you? you know? Yeah, we, we've we've gone through. If you look back at you know over the last uh, seven years or so, we've gone quite through quite a rapid expansion um, globally. Um, as you said, we're now in 46 offices in 32 countries. We're probably reaching a stage where we don't need to grow that, that much and certainly not at the pace we've been growing it over the last seven years. So we're, more, we're perhaps more consolidating what we've got now. Um, looking forward, there's probably, I don't know, five or six countries where we might consider, but none of them are top of our you know, immediate priorities at the moment. Um, and for us, it's a combination of um, client need and where there's a perceived where we perceive there is a client need um, and where we perceive we can get the best talent so South Africa is a good example of that we opened in Johannesburg because we found that we could hire the very best finance lawyer in in South Africa um, otherwise we wouldn't have opened there so we don't just plant a flag and say that's a great place to be let's open and send someone from London we're looking for the very best local people and combining that with our global platform that's our model Obviously, you have a rising middle class, uh, uh, although it's not as large as some people may think. In fact, Nestle made a decision about, about one of the countries yeah. it was in. I think it was uh, South Africa uh, because there wasn't the middle class, uh, they thought. Yes. Um, are you disappointed in terms of what's going on with some of the emerging markets right now? Or, or obviously, you're playing the long game. Very much so. Yeah, we're not... No, I mean, I think if you were to invest on the basis that you have to get instant results, um, then you're, you're going to be disappointed. So we have found over the years, our very first office outside London was opened in 1978, and that was Dubai. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we are now the leading international firm in the Middle East, because we've been there a long time. We're very embedded. We know the business community. We're part of the business community. We just, we've just been there an awful long time. And our experience has been that the earlier you start in a market, the better it is yeah. later on. Um, and so we take a very long-term view of that. And we're lucky that we've got a patient partnership who are prepared to invest. And you kind of really do believe that long-term part of your role as a partner is to leave the place in a better shape than, where you, than how you found it. As you said, you're known well and for your banking expertise, and your firm also does a, a lot of, uh, represents a lot of uh, banks. Uh, since the financial crisis, uh, how has that practice changed? What are you seeing now that you didn't uh, see uh, before, and how do you think it will change in the future in that area? Yeah, well, there's been some quite dramatic changes. So there's obviously been a huge amount of uh, work uh, in lots of areas, particularly regulatory, um, which has become a huge growth industry, um, and in regulatory investigations. So that's generated a lot of work. Um, and I th but when you look, when you stand back, you can see that the role that banks have been were playing in the financial marketplace has shrunk, um, and they have been shedding uh, activities. Uh, they've most of them have been slimming down what they do, um, and you. And one of the trends that we've seen very clearly is an enormous rise in the so-called alternative credit providers. Some people call them shadow banking. Um, a lot of players who've come into the markets to provide funds, um, all all kinds of uh, financings of every type, um, who are not traditional banks, um, and we have very deliberately focused on expanding. Uh, our client base amongst those other players because there's a you know that's a long-term trend. I think that's not going to that's not going to go away. Um, that's likely to continue. I think. But if you and I were sitting here five, ten years uh, from uh, now, will the banking landscape look uh, radically different, especially for the uh, you know the bulge uh, bracket uh, banks who have obviously faced greater 
regulatory scrutiny, uh, greater capital requirements, so on and, and, and so forth. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think they are, you know, they're likely to be more focused on um, a smaller number of uh, core activities. We, we notice, for example, we do, we're probably the premier capital markets practice in the world, so we see a lot of volume of, uh, of capital markets deals, and we noticed a couple of years ago, for the first time since we've been recording these statistics for over 30 years, that the top 10 banks were no longer provide, providing the majority of the capital markets deals we were doing. They slipped below, it's still a large percentage. And what we see is that the larger, the very largest deals, you still got the same, the usual players uh, in that. But the smaller deals are now being populated by all sorts of other players. Um, and that, the market is atomized in a way and encouraged by regulators, you know, because they wanted uh, more competition and they've constrained the activities of the banks. Whether in the long run that's going to be a good thing or not, it's hard to say. Obviously, hindsight is always brilliant, but do you think that banks should just be in the business, let's say, of certain types of lending and, and, and certain transactions and not, let's say, in investment banking and so on and so forth? Should there be ring fencing? Should we go back to a Glass-Steagall type of situation? Yeah. I probably don't really want to get into too much detail in that because yeah. we're heavily involved sure. in a lot of those matters for our uh, banking clients. So it's, it's probably an area um, that I wouldn't get, shouldn't get into. Yes. Mm. Well, let me ask you then some, a, a slightly different way. Do you think regulation has gone far enough? I think at the general level um, that it has probably gone far enough. Um, some would say it's gone too far. Um, I, I think it's probably, I mean, there, there's, it still needs to settle down, but most people I think would conclude right now that the banks have got to grips with this new environment and are le learning to live with it in a way which is much better than the way it was before. There's a lot of skepticisms about banks, uh, and I think well deserved given what happened and the consequences that are still uh, playing out. Uh, do you think culture is truly changing at banks? My, um, from my experience of the banks that I know and that I've worked with over the years, I would say there has been a shift in mindset, attitude and uh, culture. Um, and that banks, I think generally, this is a general statement, but, and I might not have said this three or four years ago, um, but now I think my experience is that uh, uh, bankers have understood that um, the, w the world has changed and what is expected of them um, has changed. But is that being driven by, uh, by sort of recognizing a moral compass or is it being driven by the huge uh, fines that they're paying for, for wrongdoing? It's probably a combination of <laughs> those things, I guess. Yeah. The, it takes a long time uh, to change um, to change culture and to change mindsets and, and attitudes. Um, it just does take a long, long time. Why do you think we got to this place where you know there was uh, people who were either trying to manipulate the system? Or, I mean, the, the greed seems to be far greater than it was, let's say, when you were entering. Uh, yeah. You know. The yeah. Profession. I think there was a combination of reasons. Uh, you know, one. It's pretty clear now, I think, that um, rele relaxing uh, the regulatory environment for banks wasn't such a great idea. Um, I think you could possibly argue that allowing uh, investment banks and commercial banks to become one wasn't such a, uh, a great idea. There's definitely something, I think, in the, uh, the, the compensation structures which incentivized the wrong behaviors. I think uh, you know, people are beginning to realize that there's a lot you know, there's a lot uh, of issues in there um, as well. And um, yeah, and I think but banks did lose sight a bit of, uh, you know, their ultimate purpose in society. Yeah. Another question for you here. Uh, you know, where do you see Latin America on the legal map? Uh, could you consider yourself growing there in addition to your office in Brazil? White and Case, another big firm, is in Mexico. Yeah. Would there be a first mover advantage in Colombia? This is from Sebastian Wallace. Right. Um, Yes, I think um, we do believe as a firm that we're a bit underinvested in, uh, in South America. Um, there's lots of historical reasons for that, but traditionally the, 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 the markets from outside South America 
um, that have been most relevant to South America have been dominated by New York um, rather than by London, for example, or even Madrid. Um, but I think longer term, um, Latin America is going to be very important to us as a firm. And so right. I think because it's a, it's a big place, there are a lot of some important economies uh, there. Um, it's increasingly part of the, the global economy. And many of our clients are doing deals there. Um, so th for all those reasons, the same reasons we're in other parts of the world. Yeah. Cheap money has fueled a lot of uh, deals. What happens when uh, you know, the Fed starts raising rates or the Bank of England starts raising rates? I realize it's going to be a very gradual approach, but what impact do you think that's going to have? It's difficult to say. I, I think, um, as I say, I remain um, fairly optimistic, realistically optimistic um, about the economic future. Um, yes, I think there's likely to be a bit of a shock. I suspect there's, I mean, I talk to my kids, for example, yeah. and tell them about when I had a mortgage, interest rates went up to 14% yeah. at one stage. And they look at me as like, I'm mad. They just can't imagine that era because they've grown up in an era of, uh, in adulthood, in an era of extraordinarily uh, low rates. So I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't quite a degree of dislocation when that starts to change. Um, is that bad for law firms? I suspect not um, for those firms who are well positioned, well diversified. You've been thinking a lot about it. We talked about it earlier, but I want to come back to it about how your firm has has changed. And you know, you wrote a very interesting article about the various breakdown, the way uh, corporate clients are using services and general counsels and so on and so forth, contract lawyers and all sorts of things. Yeah. Is this the future? You know, how are you dealing with it and, and responding? So, so we have a we believe that um, the legal industry is going through a period of quite profound change. Um, there's a lot of forces which are bearing down on the industry, um, which actually are no different from the forces affecting many other industries in the industries of our clients. But for centuries, the legal industry has been relatively insulated uh, from that, uh, and we think that's changing. Um, so. You know, the, the, the impact of technology, for example, globalization, of course, uh, the regulatory environment. So in the UK, for example, the regulatory environment's now changed. So non-lawyers can invest in law firms. That's feeding innovation. It's bringing people into the law, into the profession, into the business of law um, who don't think like lawyers. They think like business people. Um, and they've got new ideas about how, how legal services should be delivered. And that is combining with much more competition than I think we've ever seen uh, before. And that's only going in one direction. That's only going to increase. And the impact of competition means that if you're not prepared to be flexible to adapt to what the clients are saying they want, then the clients can always go somewhere else. So, so break it down for me. So, what we, so our, the way we see this is, first of all, I would start by saying we're very bullish. I'm personally very bullish about the long-term future for smart lawyers. I don't think, I don't believe in, you know, that the end of lawyers is nigh or anything like that. I think that's ridiculous. There's always going to be a need for smart lawyers. Why? Because the um, complexity of the world is accelerating at a faster rate than, if you like, more routine work that lawyers have traditionally done is becoming commoditized. There's just, you know, that, it, it, those two things are not keeping pace. So the world is becoming more complicated. There's always going to be a need. But what, lawyer, uh, what clients are insisting on, I think, is different ways of delivering those legal services. They want more choices. They want more options. In the past, they had only two options. They go to a traditional law firm or they do it in-house. Now, they've got a much broader range of legal services providers who can offer a range of different services. And there's a so-called disaggregation of work going on. So the very high-end strategic work might come to us, for example, the more routine work might go to a legal services provider in India, for example. And that's happening across the world. Some places are faster paced uh, than others, but I think that's a long-term trend which is not gonna go away. So our approach to that is to say, why don't we have a firm which has a kind of hybrid business model? So we have the traditional law firm at the core, but we are also experimenting with a number of other uh, ways of delivering uh, legal services. And it's all around, essentially it's around the deployment of technology and resourcing and expertise and delivering that in a way that is designed to Ex produce better solutions yeah. for clients. Expand on that for me, if you can. So what we've done is, um, 
what we have done is um, grown, uh, we've invested in several uh, new business, um, changes to our business model. Um, one of them is online services, for example, we now provide online um, services where the clients pay a subscription uh, to subscribe to specialists, a very highly specialist online service where they can go online and they can essentially find the answer they want to their particularly in particularly complex areas uh, online and they pay a, subs a subscription fee for that. That's growing at more than 30% a year. Um, it's a very, very profitable business and um, we're in the process of scaling that up. Um, we've also developed, um, we about three years ago, we, um, we had uh, we opened in Belfast. We had nobody in Belfast three years ago. Now we have 400 people in Belfast. We moved our back office there. We re-engineered our processes so that we could become more operationally efficient. And we have a team of paralegals there who have become, become really expert at processing so-called more routine work. Um, a lot of law, for, law firms are a little bit snobby about that. And they say, we only do high-end work. Um, which I think is not true in most cases. Most cases you're doing a mixture of high-end and not so high-end work in reality. And so we found a way, I think, to be much more efficient at how we do that not so high-end piece of that larger deal. So that's saving the client money, presumably, but you're, yes. and then you take a certain margin, of course, off that as well, yeah. We're a business, you Absolutely. know, obviously no, no, we're, no, we're trying. No, 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 I'm just uh, understanding the yeah, business model, how it works. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah. We, what we're essentially trying to do is to offer more options uh, to clients. Contract lawyers is another thing. You yes. think that's a growing area, not only for you, but in terms of yeah. the choices uh, individuals make who go into the law. Yes, uh, we think that there's, um, uh, first of all, we think, you know, if you stand back and look at the traditional law firm model, it's very inflexible. Um, it's, it, it, it doesn't really work for anybody, actually, because it's inflexible for the law firm because you've either got too many people or you haven't got enough. It's very rarely that you've got just the right number, the Goldilocks scenario. Um, it can be inflexible for individuals. It's a one-dimensional career track, um, typically, um, which is particularly tough on women um, in the law. Um, and one of the reasons, I think, why there are not enough um, women partners in, in larger law firms. And um, so it's, it's, it's a model. It doesn't really work for clients either because it's inflexible. So what we see is that there's a, a change to that model and what we've built is a business called PeerPoint. We now have 80 lawyers in that business um, and they work flexibly. Some of them want to work nine months a year and then spend three months surfing. Some of them want to look after families. Some want to do, you know, work in lots of different ways. And we use them to deal with the peaks in demand that we get in our own business. But we now increasingly are offering those to clients to deal with their own resourcing uh, issues. Now, of course, you know, you've been with the same firm for 35 years. When you started out, as you said earlier, you know, it was very small. Now it's, it's a much larger uh, firm. Uh, for those entering now, they know they have to work hard. But the likelihood of them staying at Allen and Overy 35 years, that's pretty remote, isn't it? And if so, why? And that's one of the big changes. Yeah? It, is, it is a big change. I think um, when, I, when I joined the firm, I, I, I suppose... I don't remember thinking about it like this, but I suppose there was an expectation that if you worked hard and were loyal, you know, there was probably a long-term career for you there. Um, I think that model has definitely changed for all sorts of reasons. And, and basically, I think what we say to our young lawyers is we, 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 we're not offering you lifetime employment. That's just unrealistic nowadays. No business can do that. But we will offer you lifetime employability. So we will train you, we will give you experience, you will work with the best lawyers in the world in a way that will equip you for a successful career, whatever you may choose to do and wherever you may choose to do it in the future. And I think people, you know, the younger generation who are coming through now kind of expect that they will do a, a number of different things in their life and their careers. You mentioned women who were very good lawyers who left uh, presumably to go have uh, children and then decide at some point to uh, re-enter and they become part of this umbrella under this uh, contract uh, service uh, you have. But at the same time, it's a, it's a rather gentle re-entry uh, because once they've been out, there are certain factors that can happen. These are very bright women, but one of the things you point out, they can lose confidence and so on and so forth. Uh, tell yeah. me how you help them transition back. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we've, we've really tried to focus hard on this. We have a number of schemes now to try and encourage uh, because we're looking for talented uh, lawyers and we think there's a big pool out there of women lawyers that may have left the law, typically to have a family, but maybe for other reasons, um, 
but who may want to come back. But it may be hard for them for all sorts of reasons to come back on a 24-7 you know, basis on a permanent contract. Um, so we're, and if they want to do that, then we, obviously we're going to welcome them. Um, but what we found is that, is that um, many women in that situation want something a bit more flexible. Um, and a key to it to start with is to help them back into the workforce, to train them, to give them the confidence to brush up their skills and so on so that they feel confident about taking on that role. After that, then they can make a choice about how, they, how much they want to, of their life they want to commit to work. A few more questions, and thank you for uh, submitting them. This is from uh, Robert uh, Millard from uh, Moeller uh, PSF Group. Do you agree with the view that the global legal uh, services market of the future will be dominated by around 20 global mega firms, with other law firms being relegated to regional or specialized roles? I wouldn't use the word relegation um, because I think you know the legal market globally is a huge market. I mean, it's hundreds of billions of dollars every year um, in fees. It's a very, very big market, and I think there is room for lots of different models. I do think that one of those models will be big global players, yes, because I think there are many clients out there who need that type of capability, resource, in-depth expertise to handle the very largest transactions and so on. So I do think whether it'll be 20 or not, I don't know. It won't be 200, but um, maybe it's 20, maybe it's a bit more, a bit less, I don't know. Um, but it won't be a very large group, I think. But I think it would be a big mistake to say that means everybody else is somehow second rate or second class. I just don't agree with that at all. And Tarek uh, from uh, Dubai asks, uh, and you know, we're talking about sort of the global economy, of course, uh, you do have this uh, nuclear uh, sanctions uh, a, a deal, or excuse me, the nuclear deal with, with Iran. Uh, what effect do you think the possible reentry of Iranian banks into the European and US markets would be if sanctions uh, are lifted, went through? If the agreement goes through and the sanctions Yeah, I, I guess long term, I'm a kind of see myself as a bit of a global citizen, I yeah. suppose. So long term, assuming that deal works and uh, both sides kind of stick to what they say they're agreeing, then in the long run, I think it must be positive for the world and, f and therefore for the legal industry that uh, Iran comes back into the global economy. Um, We've seen examples, it's not, the, you know, not for the same reasons, but for example, we opened an office in Myanmar a couple of years ago. Myanmar came back into the global economy three or four years ago, having been 50 years in almost total isolation, which is terrible for its people um, and not positive for the global economy. It's good for everybody, for these countries to come back in. Another question here uh, for you. This is on uh, you know, cyber attacks and cyber uh, crime. You know. You're reportedly joining uh, forces with other law firms and banks to exchange information on, on cybercrime. This is actually a question from me. Yeah. Uh, you know, is this an acknowledgement that law firms are currently vulnerable to a uh, cyber attack? Or, uh, um, there, there is a view in, uh, the, I think, the US and probably the UK government as well that um, uh, some law firms are, are vulnerable um, to cyber attack. I would say cyber security is probably one of the biggest security threats the world faces uh, right now, maybe bigger than anything else. Um, and it's, I think people are still a little bit blasé about the risks. I mean, we put an extraordinary amount of effort into making sure our systems are um, at reaching the very high standards in terms of uh, security and so on. Our clients demand no less. I mean, for many of our largest clients insist that we uh, can demonstrate that we can achieve those standards. And they're right to insist that. And we would do that anyway. Um, but it's, that's a, it's a really big issue for the future. I mean, no, no one, I think it would be a very brave person to say my firm is invulnerable to cyber attack or it's not something we have to worry about. You just mentioned, you know, cybersecurity as being one of the very big issues moving forward. I think most people uh, would, would agree with that. Uh, you know, we talked about, you know, your, your outlook for the global economy, you're relatively uh, optimistic. Uh, what do you think the major trends going forward will be? And they may be areas that uh, you know, your firm will do well by, and they may be other areas that don't deal with your firm, but you think will have a profound impact going forward. Yeah. Do you mean in the legal industry or, or Both, for the legal world economy? Yeah, yeah, world economy, legal yeah. industry. You know. Well, I guess you know, taking the legal industry, I think some of the trends going forward are, are definitely the... Um, the greater impact of technology on the practice of law, I think, is a, is a very 
uh, clear trend. Um, there's a, it's a kind of, it's a process, if you like, you could call it the industrialization of law. Um, and if you, uh, you've talked to your um, industrial clients, car makers and so on, they went through a process 20, 25 years ago, focused on very lean production, very efficient ways of running their business. And professions like the law, but also other professional services, management consulting, health services, educational services and so on, are just at the foothills of that process, I think. So there's a whole, I think, you know, trend there that's going to move towards making professional services much, much more efficient. I don't think that means fewer people doing professional services. I just think we'll be doing different types of work. How will that technology manifest itself, though? Lots of different ways. I think we've only just really begun to um, get to, well, an example would be if you take dispute resolution. Um, eBay, for example, has a dispute resolution process that processes millions of small disputes every single year with no great problem. Um, and so I can, see, I can see a world where there's much more online resolution uh, of disputes. You see that in the UK, for example, there was a recent report led by Richard Susskind recommending that the courts adopt a much more online approach to this. And, yeah. and he's right. And where else in technology, for instance, to me? Because obviously you're thinking about this quite a bit because it impacts your business and it could be an opportunity as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, th I think there's, um, there's all sorts of uh, way. I mean, for example, there's a big trend now in how you uh, analyze documents. You know, you, you, in litigation, you could easily have a million documents to analyze. There's a huge trend uh, going on there to, for to do that mechanically using uh, computers, artificial intelligence, fuzzy logic, those kinds of things, um, which is only accelerating, I think. Anything else that comes to mind? I, I realize I'm pressing you, but this is the future, so. <laughs> I, yeah, I, see, I just see a world where um, law, the best law firms will be delivering their legal advice much more effectively using uh, technology. So it's not just about how you run your own operation effectively, it's more about how you deliver services. So if I'll give you an example. We are uh, in Belfast when we're doing a, uh, a huge piece of due diligence, for example, um, tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of documents and so on. We use a workflow product so that the client can go in 24 hours, any time of the night or day, they can see exactly where we are in the process, what the results are so far. It's all completely open to them. That's an example of, that's actually not particularly novel uh, technology. For a lot of firms, it is novel. But your retainer that you're using for uh, clients who want to go basically online to find uh, solutions to certain problems, that's another yeah. example of that. That wouldn't have been is. possible 10 years ago. No, yeah, no right? it wouldn't have been yeah, possible, yeah. Okay. Not, I don't think that that's going to replace, I, you know, I'm not suggesting that's going to replace all traditional provision of legal services, but it's just another way in which particular services can be uh, developed. Yeah. Let me ask you something about uh, an area I know that you are passionate about. You've been very innovative uh, about this. You went to a state comprehensive, like I said. There's a lot of criticism, certainly here in the UK, about the, in the legal profession, as in you know, be it judges or lawyers themselves, uh, that too many people went to elite uh, schools. Uh, you are trying to help uh, uh, redress that uh, balance in, in, in some ways. How are you doing it and what more needs to be done? Obviously a lot needs to be done, but what should be done? Yeah. Well, here's the problem. You know, when I joined the law, I was lucky in a way because the profession was beginning to open up. There was a huge increase in demand and the profession needed to find new sources of talent. Because if I joined 10 years earlier, probably not coming from a particularly well-connected or privileged uh, family or with a legal background, yeah. I would probably have struggled. Um, so I, I was lucky. And, um, but if you, when I came into the law, it, it, it's harder to get into the law now if you come from an average or below average income family than it was when I joined the law 35 years ago. Why? For a whole complicated series uh, of uh, reasons. Um, partly to do with education, partly to do with aspirations, partly to do with recruitment policies, partly, I mean, a whole combination of things. It's not capable of a simple answer. Um, and it's not that someone's deliberately set out to make it that way. That's kind of how things have evolved. So my, from my perspective, I think that in the long run, it's 
cannot be good for the profession to recruit, if you like, from a relatively narrow section of society. Because in the long run, if we don't, to some measure, broadly reflect the society that we serve, we will become irrelevant uh, to that society or so detached as to be useless. Um, and I think that's a long-term challenge for the society. I also think it's a long-term challenge for individual law firms because you want talent from a diverse range of, of, of backgrounds um, who can bring lots of different ideas to uh, the problems of the future, not people who are coming from one set of attitudes and mindsets. So are you actively seeking out uh, you know, people who are about to graduate from a university who come from a poor background and are you, like many um, of the top uh, private schools here, trying to target a certain percentage of uh, students from disadvantaged backgrounds? It's, it, again, it's, it's a complicated issue, but it, in essence, we as a firm go out of our way to go to a wide range of universities in the UK. I'm talking about the UK here. I mean, there, there are similar issues in the US and other countries, but they have different, there are different nuances. But in the UK, we go out of our way. We have our current trainee population is recruited from 39 different universities. Honestly, we could probably recruit all the trainees we need from probably two universities. Um, but we don't do that because we want to find the very best talent uh, wherever it is. And we work hard to do that because we think in the long term that's good for the firm. Uh, another question here, and we're almost out of time, but some have predicted that partnerships uh, will be replaced by corporate systems of equity ownership and management. Uh, do you agree, and if so, what might cause this? Very interesting question. Yeah, um, I think that that could happen for some firms, and it might be the right answer for some. But for a lot, I don't think it will be the right answer. The, the partnership model, I think, uh, is often derided as a bit old-fashioned, a bit slow at decision-making, um, but it has some inherent strengths when you're bringing together a lot of autonomous knowledge workers, which is what most lawyers are. Um, and for example, it does not have the so-called agency problem that a lot of corporates have, where there's a separation of interest between the people who own the business and the people who run the business. We do not have that in a partnership. We are completely aligned, 100%. Um, and that's an important strength that I think um, a lot of lawyers would be very, very reluctant to give up. Biggest mistake most big law firms make, you think? Complacency. Thinking the world is going to continue the way that it always has uh, continued um, and not preparing for um, the, the, the way the world is changing. You talked, you just uh, characterized lawyers as autonomous knowledge uh, workers. Um, do you think that there is a certain personality that suits a lawyer? Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I do. Um, the, uh, the most important attribute of being a lawyer, of course, is you have to be good looking. So, you know, you know, everybody knows that. Um, but the, the, um, uh, there's a pessimism. There's, there's a certain, I think, you know, the average lawyer by virtue of their training, probably by virtue of their personality that attracted them in the first place. It's close analytical work. You have to look at the downsides. You have to consider the risks. You have to look for all the loopholes. So it tends to produce people who tend to be a bit more pessimistic than the average the Studies person. show this, don't they? They do. There are psychological studies which, uh, which uh, demonstrate that. Yeah, yeah, there are. But the interesting thing is that law firm leaders tend to be, on the whole, a bit more optimistic than the whole. I think you, you do need to be, uh, have a degree of optimism to be an effective leader. Nobody wants a misery guts yeah. as a leader. And, and what do you think makes an effective uh, leader? Um, my, I think top of my list would be a, a, an enthusiasm, a real genuine enthusiasm for the business and what we're trying to achieve. Um, a sense of the future, of, of, if you like, the vision. Um, a good strategic appreciation of the market. Um, a, it's got to be somebody in, in the law firm world. Law is a personal business. You've got to be a people person. Uh, it's in the end, it's all about the people. Okay. And one final question. Okay. That, that's a great way to end, but I want to ask you one question about cycling because I know you're a very keen cyclist. <laughs> uh, you, you cycle some 40 miles, kilometers, kilometers each way. Yeah. Not every day, day, but I do that. So yes. Yeah. Mm. What is it about cycling that 
you know, excites you so much. And can you make any parallels between that and the law, or do you think it helps make you a better lawyer, or is it just completely independent? Well, I was, I was listening to a report on the radio yesterday that said exercise grows your brain. Um, and I think that's true, actually. Um, I'm not sure it's been true in my case, but I think in general it's probably true. And there's something about exercise that energizes you, that kind of refreshes your mind, that enables you to, um, you know, keep things in perspective, which is very important to me. Yeah. Uh, Dave Morley, uh, senior partner at Allen Overy, real pleasure uh, speaking with you today. I'm Todd Benjamin from the National Bar Association. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you very much, Todd.